infinite chess and it's already second year that we are uh, implemented it all around the world and of course i am very happy and very grateful to uh, fide to president of fide uh, arkady Dvorkovich, uh, to support our initiative and of course to international olympic committee uh, together with uh, fide planning and development commission to support us uh, from financial point of view and of course uh, my big thanks to um, fide managing director dana resnice ozala who is supporting us for any ways that we are asking to be supported uh, to organize seminar conferences and of course develop our program so i'm, I'm very proud that we are moving forward uh, we are still in the process to get budget for research and i hope that next year will uh, bring us the good news about this and uh, this seminar today we organize especially uh, for the participants who will launch the project in their country from uh, uh, October, November th this year. But of course, we're always looking for good partners, uh, different federations, uh, different uh, um, chess associations or chess clubs who wants to do it together with us. So if you are one of those people, uh, after conference, please uh, reach me or Nadia and uh, uh, we will discuss our potential cooperation in this field. It is really my great honor to greet you all here today uh, uh, in the opening of the training session for you, the future instructors of uh, our uh, educational um, program that is dedicated for children with uh, autistic spectrum disorder. This project, the Infinite Project, is one of the most important ones among uh, all our social agenda that we've been carrying out in uh, FIDE over the last one and a half years. Uh, while we do understand that besides the sportive uh, part, we do have another mission to carry on as an international sports organization, which is using chess for the benefit of society. So uh, this program has been uh, developed uh, last year with uh, Allah and other uh, experts uh, greatly contributing. Thank you very much for being courageous enough and joining the team and uh, contributing and sharing your knowledge and uh, time and energy to create this product that now can be shared with other brave countries, other brave people who are um, encouraged to, to, to take it on, uh, spread it in their training. And uh, while it's important, especially important for us, um, uh, it is uh, it is uh, uh, that uh, you are the front runners. You are the flagship uh, uh, countries um, who've been. Um, who been um, uh, who 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 will have a great responsibility not only to test it to try to 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 try it but also to give the feedback for us to be able to improve the methodologies to improve the training system and uh, so that it's uh, more successful and and uh, better to be uh, spread uh, uh, spread around the world. So uh, we are trying hard on our half, uh, as Anastasia also said, to um, get additional supporters, raise some funding, but not only uh, uh, raise some funding, but also get additional hands and brains who would help us with the research and uh, contribute in further development of the program. That's very uh, crucial for uh, for the sustainability sustainability of uh, uh, of the program. Yes, I see Natalia is also here. Natalia, your name is also very special uh, in this um, in this in this program. Uh, the other other colleagues will uh, evaluate your experience and uh, your contribution as well. I'm pretty sure that uh, that uh, they'll learn a lot from you and your hands-on and the expertise. So um, thank you very much uh, for being here for being ready to contribute. I know that at the end of the day, you all will invest much more uh, time and energy that's ex than expected, but, uh, that, but, but I'm uh, completely sure that that will be for the benefit of uh, those kids that afterwards will learn and uh, for your societies and for the chess world and FIDA in, in general. I appreciate that very much.
Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Dana. And uh, uh, we are ready to start. And I would like to introduce uh, our first uh, speaker from New Zealand, uh, uh, Evgenia Charamova, Bacalar of Science, Master in Speech Therapy, former New Zealand uh, Women's Chess Champion and Speech Language Therapist. Uh, Evgenia, please. Great. Okay, I'm very excited to be here. So thank you for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. And um, I'm going to start with some things that I thought would be quite important uh, to think about when you are doing uh, the chess lessons with the kids. So uh, what I'm going to cover in this presentation is what is autism, uh, strong sides of autism, uh, things to take into consideration when you're teaching the kids, uh, sensory needs, trauma, preparing for the student, uh, setting up the classroom, and the, of course, the summary. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the term neurodiverse, because I might be using it throughout this presentation. And uh, it's an umbrella term that includes conditions such as ADHD, dyspraxia, autism, and dyslexia. And the Ministry of Health in New Zealand has defined autism as a difficulty um, as, as when a person has a difficulty in all of the three areas, such as language skills, uh, this could be comprehension, spoken language, uh, cognitive and thinking skills. So the child or the, the person um, might have repetitive behavior, uh, some difficulty being flexible in terms of their routine, uh, social behavior. So just um, having some difficulty reading those social cues, understanding social situations. So some things that I have encountered when I was teaching a child with autism chess, um, that he, he was amazing at um, playing and he was able to follow all the rules. He knew all the pieces here. Um, he was really good, but the difficulty that he had was when he had to shake hands with other students. And um, th I think that was uh, something that when I saw that, I was just like, oh, this, this is quite interesting. I, I thought that, um, you know, it, it's something that only happens for maybe a couple of seconds, that handshake, but um, he needed support with that as well. Just understanding how to uh, hold the hand, how to shake it in a way that it doesn't actually even maybe hurt the opponent. And um, I'll just go to this slide here. So I wanted to share this video. It's um, by Dr. Temple Grandin. She is a scientist and she is also she also has autism and she just shares her experience, what it is like to have it. But what you do is you learn better as you learn more and more things. Well, I didn't speak until I was four. Now I have a BA and a master's and I'm studying for my doctorate. I can remember the frustration of not being able to talk. I couldn't get my words out. My speech came in gradually, a few words at a time. When I was a little kid, I was very autistic, nonverbal, rocking, you know, that's the kind of kid they just put away in an institution. But I had a speech teacher that worked really hard with me, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of young children getting early intervention. You got a two-year-old or three-year-old, no speech, don't wait. High school is absolutely worst part of my life. Teasing, teasing, teasing. I got kicked out of school for throwing a book at a girl. Teased me because, you know, teasing really made my life miserable. And the only places I could get away from teasing was the specialized activities. Things like horseback riding, electronics lab, model rocket club. The line was drawn in the sand. I was not allowed to become a recluse in my room. I had to get out and do things. I'm always kind of baffled at just how illogical people are in their thinking. I'm very logical in my thinking. But when I was younger, I didn't know that other people thought more in words. You see, I think in pictures. If I don't have a picture, I don't think. And my mind is very, very associative. Being a visual thinker, I have to I tend to put things into categories. You see, autism is a very big spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you've got half the people at Silicon Valley. And then at the other end of the spectrum, You've got somebody who's very handicapped, remains nonverbal, is, is going to have to live in a supervised living situation. Really, really big spectrum. And, you know, Einstein probably be labeled autistic today in a lot of school systems because he had no speech until age three. I'm interested in seeing something that makes real change. 
I've done a lot of work that's made a lot of improvements in the livestock industry. And I think I've helped a lot of kids succeed. I want to see the kids that are like me succeed. That's the kind of stuff that makes me happy. When I see the things that I do make a difference. Okay. You know, oh, you never sorry. get cured of it. Just go back. Okay. So what I wanted to uh, highlight from her presentation was that she was talking about categorizing things and um, how she puts things into categories. And it's something that I will come back to a little bit later in the presentation. And some of the things uh, that she talked about, that she's a visual learner, she sees things in pictures. So those are the strong things in autism, I think, that could um, help the child to become, or the student to become a, a strong chess player, uh, such as having, being able to think logically, having a very strong memory. Um, you know, I've been amazed because sometimes I tell a student something two months ago once, and the person remembers it two months later. Um, it, they sometimes the, like the kids could be very punctual, um, have very strong, very good concentration. But it also depends if um, they're motivated to, if they're interested in the activity. So that's why it's very important to know what they like. Um, and I guess it's. Um, goes like if we start thinking about what does playing chess involve and um, those things that the kids might have with autism could like I said before make them strong chess players such as maintaining attention right so you have to have good concentration um, memorizing uh, different um, maybe openings right um, learning the value of pieces um, be able to follow rules And so I guess once we, what I'm going to move to, towards now is about um, learning about the like what are some of the things important about teaching the student, right? Um, and I think one thing that's really important is understanding what the student is like. So that, and it's something that Dr. Perry said, he said that instead of trying to change how a person with autism reacts, um, we, one second, I can't see it. Uh, to us, we need to pay close attention to how we react to the person. And um, some of the things to consider when teaching a child, um, especially a child that has high functioning uh, autism, is that sometimes they, even though they have very good spoken language, uh, sometimes they might have difficulty in terms of maybe sequencing events. So when you will ask them, uh, about like what did you do during the week right um, or what did you do on Saturday and Sunday uh, they might have difficulty actually putting those events in order and they might even add some things that didn't happen um, they some they, they can take things very literally uh, so you have to be very careful maybe like what type of jokes you make or because they, they can take it at face value um, also understanding how much they can understand uh, just like the understanding multiple step instructions. So it's probably better to start with very um, simple instructions at the start and then just see you, um, how much they can actually understand. Um, and the other thing that they might do is they might uh, link past events to an object. And um, that goes back to categorizing uh, things. So for example, if you have put a picture of a plane here, um just to to show you if a child looks outside and there's a plane flying and you can say oh so what are you seeing uh, and then they say oh the plane has broken windows the plane is going to fall down so um they might be linking those events that they might have seen on um the tv and they might be linking it to that object and um so those are things that you could potentially encounter and uh, sometimes they're quite tricky to pick up uh, that's why i'm uh, talking about this in this presentation and i think the other thing is important to know how good is the hearing uh, it's a uh, it's an obvious thing but uh, sometimes it's good to check as well and their vision i mean do they wear glasses and also um can they distinguish images and uh, does the image, for example, have too many lines on it and it's hard for them to actually 
um, understand what's on the on the picture. So it's something that you, um, I think, uh, have to be aware of as well, that they might not actually um, be able to see the image because it might be too, the page might be too cluttered. And um, so some of the things that could be tricky is giving instructions and also preventing meltdowns. And I think the best thing is to, if you have a chance to come into the classroom and to observe what the student is like in the class, how the teachers are talking to the student, how the parents are talking to the students, um, are they able to understand those instructions? And is the teacher or the parent using any visual supports to help the student? Um, what are the sensory needs of the student? Uh, what are their triggers? Is there a behavior management plan um, that you might be able to have a look at? Uh, so that in case if anything happens while you teach, you know how to react to the student and how to calm the student down. And yeah. And really know the student. I mean, taking the time to spend the time with the student, maybe even not just playing chess, maybe just looking at what they enjoy doing, like playing video games. Um, so for example, um, you know, just finding out about their interests. Um, also, um, I guess some of the things that would be good to know as well, their emergency contact uh, when you, so who the person who you should contact. Um, if they are, are on any medication as well, just um, what, because the medication might impact how they are when you're teaching them. Um, and I guess also what are their dislikes and what are the triggers. And also their sensory needs. So it's basically um, what are the sensory things that they might be seeking? And you can talk, I mean, if there is an OT that you have, an occupational therapist that you can talk to in the classroom, that's also very good because they will be able to give you more uh, information about the student. So for example, a student that uh, might be fiddling with a lot of things, um, picking up the pencils, like um, that might be seeking uh, the proprioception input. Um, sometimes they might be like running around the classroom, they might be seeking the vestibular input, they might be making lots of noise, so that's um, having that audio input. Um, so understanding um, what are the needs and how much um, regulation do you need to do during the class as well? Maybe it has to be every 10 minutes that you need to, for example, um, go on the trampoline and or go on the um, swing with them or so that they actually not don't have the meltdowns at the end of the lesson. Um, I would like to share another video about um, sensory overload. So hopefully that will. Why do autistic people cover their ears? And can you help us when we do? When we cover our ears, that's usually to protect ourselves. We can be very sensitive to sound, and so it can hurt sometimes. Our ears may not be more acute than yours, but our brains can process sound differently. This means some sounds can feel really loud. This is called sensory processing disorder, and it means we can become overloaded by sensory information, such as noise and vibrations from music, traffic, and voices. Sensory overload can lead us to melt or shut down, which are extreme stress responses where we lose control of ourselves, and that can be terrifying. You can help us by reducing the noise and sensory input, using noise cancelling headphones, background noise to help mask some of the unpleasant noise, quiet spaces and quiet hours. Recognize our triggers so we can avoid them and be understanding when we feel overwhelmed. Have we missed any? Why do you cover your ears? Let us know in the comments below. All right. Uh, I think something that they talked about um, using um, headphones and um, Oh, sorry, earphones to mask that noise. And actually, sometimes kids really don't like them. So that's not something that might work. Um, 
So those understanding the sensory needs would help you prepare the classroom. So for example, maybe having a trampoline inside the classroom, maybe having um, access to the swing outside, uh, having fidgeting toys, uh, weighted blankets. So if they need that deep pressure input, uh, maybe chewy toys, so anything that could help them regulate. Also, I put down this, um, this I've put down this picture, I've put up this picture of a timer. And um, this is a visual timer and it, it works really well with some students. So if, for example, you want to change the activity, you could put it, um, for example, five minutes and then they can see, they can understand when this five minutes will be over. Um, I quickly want to go over developmental trauma. So it doesn't mean if a child has autism, they will have developmental trauma. Uh, it's just something to be aware of um, because it's about their regulation inside the classroom. And uh, developmental trauma could be co caused uh, by neglect, abuse, um, something very traumatic that has happened to the child when they were growing up, such as loss of a loved one. And um, it will it could impact their a way of regulating their emotions. So for example, a typical way of regulating emotions um, is when a person is able to identify that emotion. Um, for example, oh, I'm feeling sad and then express it. For example, sharing with someone, I'm feeling very sad and then being able to manage it. So for example, when I'm sad, I can go for a walk and that will make me happy. So, um, the first part, and this is just a, a picture of a brain, and um, in a typical developing a brain, um, there will be there will be a brainstem, there will be, for example, a limbic brain and a cortical brain, and um, all of these sections will be connected together. Um, however, when and so when a child is under stress, um, they interact between each other. However, when a child has had uh, developmental trauma, some of the sections might not be formed um, very well. And so that link is not going to be there. So it would look something like this. So for example, a person who is um, who didn't have uh, developmental trauma, their brain um, will be connected. Oh, I'm sorry, in a second, I'll go back. So um, this is the primitive brain, this is the limbic system, and this is the cortex. But for a child who has had developmental trauma, those sections will be separate. And then the child, when they will be upset, will be acting from their primitive brain, which is the impulse. Uh, so it's the fight, flight, or freeze response. So a 70 year for example, a 17 year old um, person might have a, an ability to self-regulate as a three year old child. And that means they will need a lot of support to being able to, to become calm again. So some of the triggers uh, that could set the child off uh, if they've had developmental trauma are loud noise, um, for example, maybe new environment, uh, something that's uh, very stressful for the child. Um, and so they're not able to self-regulate. Um, and that's why it's important to understand those behavioral management plans if the child has them, uh, so that you're able to uh, help prevent meltdowns. So, and if the meltdowns happen, you can redirect the child, you can give them space, or it depends whatever works for that specific person. Um, or maybe you will need to take them on trampoline or go for a swing. So I think when you are preparing for the classroom, it's really important to build that connection with the child. Um, maybe even prepare the student before the lesson happens. Um, like to have very good uh, consistent routines and you can do that through social narratives. So for example, explaining to the child, maybe even these pictures that you're going to have a chess lesson in one week time, you're going to have a chess lesson with this person. This is what we're going to do. Having visual schedules inside the classroom is, uh, would be, I think, very, would, would, would benefit the, the students quite a lot. Uh, and also having that specific routine that happens, that's very consistent, that there are no changes so that the students know what going to, what's going to happen next. Uh, understanding the sensory needs, um, and like activities that would help regulate the child. And as, as I mentioned before, behavioral management plan, if there is one.
So I think um, these books, I, if you have some time and you would like to read more about trauma, I would really recommend. Um, like The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, uh, written by Dr. Bruce Perry, um, and who specializes in the trauma, What Happened to You? And if you would like to learn more about autism, uh, Dr. Barry um, about Uniquely Human uh, is, a, is a very good book. Great, and this is the references that I've used. Great, all right, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Evgenia. Uh, and uh, I think we have uh, time for one question to you that we received in chat. Uh, does the uh, child who you taught have a problem comprehending the tactical patterns of chess or merely have problem comprehending your explanation of chess tactics and strategies? I have unfortunately haven't had um, a lot of experience teaching uh, chess to kids that have autism. Um, so I would not be able to answer the question. I've, I haven't had any difficulties uh, with, follow, like, with the child following instructions. Um, I think so, so, you know, that he was able to comprehend very well what I was saying. Um, I think it was just merely the social aspect of holding, like shaking hands and being in those social in, like situations. So I'm sorry, I know that doesn't really answer the question, but um, I think also the students are very different and you just have to take time to know them because someone um, might have difficulty with comprehension and someone might have difficulty with something else. But making it very simple, I think, is very important at the start. And then just increasing the complexity of your explanations would probably be good, good a good way to, to do it. Uh, thank you, Evgenia. And uh, after all uh, speakers will present uh, our, uh, their presentation, we will have time for questions uh, and answers session. And uh, some speakers with a lot of experience uh, um, as well uh, in teaching uh, kids uh, with autism spectrum disorder will share with you uh, their own experience. So uh, thank you, Evgenia. We know that we have a really huge time uh, difference right now. And we are going uh, to give a floor to our next uh, speaker uh, from the Netherlands. It's uh, Karel van Delft, chess teacher, coach, chess organizer, writer, lecturer, and science project manager in Chessable Science. Where to begin? I can ask a boy with autism, where are you afraid of? That can be confrontating. I can also ask him, why do you play the knight to g1? Then we are play, talking about chess pieces. In reality, we talking about him, but it's less confront, uh, confrontating. Okay, uh, you already um, introduced me. I run a chess academy. I have also uh, uh, pupils with autism in classes and in the festival. And I... Uh, work in the science team of learning club for Um Okay. Giving lessons uh, for beginners. Often we use um, mini games. For example, return the pieces. Okay, uh, I asked you, uh, I said uh, the rules are simple. You have to uh, put the uh, pieces to the beginning uh, squares. And then don't cross the middle line. Okay, kids start playing. And then they find out it will be a draw because if you do the same things, okay, another rule is not the same piece you play. But one girl, she refused because she said, uh, I can, sorry, I can take the other queen. Well, what to do? Sometimes you have to develop a cunning plan. This is the girl. So what did I do? I put the pawns in the middle because I did not need the pawns. And okay, then we had the wall. And then she starts smiling and said, yes, now I can play. Well, fidget, uh, house, earplugs. Okay, that sometimes you have adjust, make some adjustments. And by the way, this boy, now 15 years later, he became a chess trainer himself. 
after giving um, a year uh, lessons to a boy with autism, uh, I said, okay, let's sum up what did you learn? Well, and he start talking, persistence, learn to deal with lo losing, of course, chest knowledge and technique make, made him proud, uh, better concentration. Well, he wins from his granddad and his, his dad, he felt uh, proud. It made it easier for him to talk with others and to verbalize. And what was very important, he said, I can trust you. It, 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 it does not speak for itself. Or it does speak for itself, but it's not something what, what happens automatically. Okay, what is autism? To put it simple, it's in uh, your, uh, your brains are differently wired, a neurological disorder. You have trouble internalizing your sensory stimuli as a whole. Like uh, a granddaughter of mine who has autism says, I'm, I'm very busy in my head. Autistic kids uh, seek uh, refugee in fixed habits. Well, you have to solve your problems. But no autistic kid is the same. Well, some problems they have. Um, information processing, quickly overstimulated, limited empathy, social skills, imagination, strong emotions, and sometimes motor uh, limitations. Well, the kids don't understand the world, the world don't understand them. Result, confusion, fear, frustrations. So, how to overcome? Well, like Grandmaster uh, World Champion ever said, first we ordeal and then we make a plan. So, these are evident needs, structure, safe environment, concrete communication, empathy. There are also uh, often uh, strong qualities uh, involved. Systematic thinking, concentrate well, strong memory, work well by themselves, reliable. Well, you can work, uh, based on this, you can work further with them. Like also in uh, one of the first slides, the boy of 15 years old told there are benefits uh, playing and uh, training chess. You get social contacts, cognitive um, challenge, it is success experiences, it's a nice hobby. And belong to a group, gives you an uh, identity. I'm a chess player. Talking with uh, one of my pupils, he said, well, in football, there is happening too much. But uh, in, in chess, I, I can do it in my own tempo. And other um, advantages, it's individual, not physical. Clear rules, non-linguistic. And uh, structured and safe environment. So in sum, it stimulates cognitive development social development, emotional development, and even sometimes also metacognitive um, development, thinking about your own behavior and your own uh, thinking. So I think chess is a mirror, a metaphor for life, uh, and this four aspects. You can use chess for, um, development of, of kids. I give some uh, sources because uh, 10 minutes is not that long. I have a special uh, site for a few years, Schaken en Autism, and, but uh, there is a part of it, um, it's another language. It's in English, Spanish, Italian, and Danish. Danish, there is even uh, a magazine from uh, Dans uh, Scholarskak, which uh, 
with this organization, my academy works together. Um, and you see there a poster, and when you will click on there, uh, you will see uh, more information, but also um, information you can use for trainings, like, um, for example, the, that, uh, the Dutch uh, steps methods. Also, there is um, some principles for a trainer. I start with their possibilities, for example, strong memory or something they uh, will contribute to, uh, to uh, success. Give their, uh, where possible, their own responsibility. Uh, on the side, you also are subtitled interview I had with Casper uh, Hermeling. He's a chess trainer. Um, yeah, I wrote for the Dutch Federation magazine. I wrote an article about autism and chess. And then he, in a tournament, he came to me. He said, I read it. Can I help you? I was like, uh, I was a former, uh, former journalist, so always camera with me. I said, yes, we have now an interview. And then he told about his own experience, what chess brought him. So you can see it on the site. Uh, this year, I had the honor to be, uh, became chess educator of the year at um, University uh, of Texas at Dallas. And my speech was about uh, special need groups. So you, it's about an hour. You can find and it's um, recorded. So you can find it uh, via this sites. Maybe the organization, organization of this conference can put my PowerPoint uh, on the site so everybody can see the links. Uh, my Chess Academy has a Dutch site, but also uh, an English site. Uh, on this English site, some books. My son is an international master, and I wrote together a book of his. And this book, uh, Chess for Educators, um, published by New and Chess. Also, by the way, information about the London Chess Conference. Um, this book, Chess for Educators. It's about didactics, science, special need groups, and an alphabet of uh, more than 300 um, methods, psychological insights, organizational uh, advisors. Um, and as you can see here, and then I uh, finish my, my talk, it's about uh, the content. It's about didactics, preschool chairs, how to organize, role of parents, very important. Um, and then uh, highly gifted, blind, deaf, autism, dys dyslexia, uh, therapeutic chess plus management, how to organize it. Um, well, then there is some, uh, some scientific research, uh, results as well as methods. Okay, and um, that was it. So I can stop share. Thank you, Carol. And uh, we have um, questions for you. First is, how do you overcome the autistic kids' limited imagination? How do you develop their imagination? Ooh, no one is the same. So first, um, well, sometimes like with this girl, she could not imagine uh, to stay at her own uh, you, you have a practical thing. With other, uh, you discuss about it and you try to uh, always try to find kind of dialogue. Um, that's an important approach, I think. Uh, thank you. And question from Vestors. Um, he's using chess step method materials on daily basis and find it very useful for a wide variety of students. Would you recommend emphasizing individual or peer activities from step mini games when working with ADHD children? Uh, well, it can be both. It's also individual or peer activities. By the way, I, um, yeah, it's just uh, always I talk with the kids. Uh, what do you like? Um, sometimes they like to do it uh, in groups. Sometimes they do like to do it themselves. Um, well, yeah, HDHD. Um, it means they have certain limitations. I think that's also um, interesting about the book I wrote. 
that you can compare. Sometimes some advice for those dyslectic kids can also be useful for blind kids, etc. By the way, um, yeah, not only I don't uh, the step methods it's good, but I think uh, I have all uh, three pillars: it's variation, a lot of different things, uh, fascination they have to like it, and participation let them be active as possible themselves. Um, yeah, so um, you have to uh, to, uh, to make your own puzzle uh, all, every time again, but uh, very important, take the kid serious and talk uh, about him or her. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And uh, we uh, are going to present um, our next uh, speaker. It's Alla Michinka from Canada, special needs educational assistant, more than 18 uh, years of uh, experience. Uh, Alla also is uh, one of the author of our uh, chess uh, program. Hello, everybody. Hello from Canada. Uh, welcome to our second seminar, Chess for Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder, Learn and Teach. I'm very thankful for the great opportunity to present today. And I would like to thank our previous, my previous presenters and for sharing their experience. Let me start. Uh, I will maybe a little bit repeat our previous presenters, but uh, it's never harm to learn more. Let me start by giving you some background information on ASD for the participants who did not attend our first seminar. Autism spectrum disorder is a complex neurological and developmental disorder that begins early in life and affects how a person acts and interacts with others, communicates, and learns. ASD affects the structure and function of the brain and nervous system. Because it affects development, ASD is called a developmental disorder. ASD can last through a person's life. Different people with autism can have different symptoms. For this reason, autism is known as a spectrum disorder, which means that there is a range of similar features in different people with this disorder. Because autism is a spectrum disorder, each person with autism has a different set of strengths and challenges. There is no cure for autism. Today, based on my education and experience, I will introduce you to a range of strategies and resources to support students with ASD in your chess classroom. We will explore the sensory system, recognize the impact of sensory processing difficulties, and identify strategies that assist students with ASD with self-regulation. We also will talk about classroom organization, goals we want to reach, and how to teach children with autism. Before I begin, I would like to tell you the story of Carly Fleshman, who was born on January 26, 1995, a remarkable Canadian young lady who has defied all odds and inspired people worldwide. Although she was diagnosed with autism, oral motor uh, apraxia, and cognitive delay, even though she does not communicate ver verbally, her voice eventually came out and she now successfully communicate to a computer. And Nadia, are you gonna watch? Yes, I'm going to show video right now. I am an autistic girl who has learned how to spell and can tell people to stop looking at me like I am helpless. I am cute, funny, and like- Nadia, we cannot see. Oh, one minute. Can you see it now? Yeah. Thank you. I am an autistic girl who has learned how to spell and can tell people to stop looking at me like I am helpless. I am cute, funny, and like to have fun. Most of her life, Carly Fleischman was dismissed as mentally impaired. Come, I'll race you. On your mark, get set, go. But three years ago came an astonishing breakthrough. 
Carly began not only to type, but to unlock the mysteries behind her often wild behavior. <laughs> like banging her head. Because if I don't, it feels like my body is going to explode. It's just like when you shake a can of Coke. If I could stop it, I would, but it's not like turning a switch off. I know what is right and wrong, but it's like I have a fight with my brain over it. She started to realize that by communicating, she had power over her environment. Use your words. And Carly was not shy about expressing her desires and frustrations. I want to be able to go to school with normal kids, but not have them getting upset or scared if I hit a table or scream. I want something that will put out the fire. You want to go downstairs for some meat? <laughs> if that wasn't dramatic enough, for the first time she was able to have conversations with her parents. Can you come right back to dad? I want to go on a snowmobile. Can we do it? Will you go on one? I think it would be fun. So here's your daughter, 11 years old, and finally you get to meet her. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Um, Overwhelming? <laughs> Overwhelming. I stopped looking at her as a disabled person. You promised to lie to me. And started looking at her as a sort of sassy, mischievous teenage girl. We were also uh, horrified because for years we had spoken in front of her as if she wasn't there. Hi. But were these really her words and thoughts? Are you now certain that this severely autistic girl is communicating, is expressing her emotions through a computer? Yes. Positive. Positive. There's no question. None. With. I want people to know that no one is telling me what to say. And I don't have a hand up my butt like a puppet. So you got it wrong. The therapist got it wrong. Yeah, when she was originally diagnosed, yeah, it was off. They've removed that diagnosis now. That diagnosis does not appear in her medical records now. Okay, can you put it in? For all her progress communicating, Carly still needs constant supervision. A family member or aide is always at her side, directing her through simple daily tasks, like brushing her teeth, fixing her hair, even eating. Nothing is easy. Like most teens, Carly likes music, boys, clothing, and of course, going to the mall. Which one? Carly has been very clear that she sees herself as a normal child locked in a body that does things that she has no control over. No, Carly. In public, everything has to be broken down and planned to control her impulses. In the past, she has wandered off, even stolen things. Side by side with her twin sister, Taryn, it would be easy to dismiss Carly as intellectually challenged. That is, until you ask her a question. Carly. Why do autistic kids cover their ears, flap their hands, hum, and rock? It's a way for us to drown out all sensory input that overloads us all at once. We create output to block out input. Carly's brain, unlike most people's, is overwhelmed by the senses of sight and sound, taste and smell. Our brains are wired differently. We take in many sounds and conversations at once. I take over a thousand pictures of a person's face when I look at them. That's why we have a hard time looking at people. I have learned how to filter through some of the mess. I said, Carly, can you tell me why you slap yourself? She wrote back that she does it to stop her from doing something that she knows she's not supposed to do. What is she trying to do? If she has an impulse to go in and empty out all the drawers in her room and strip her bed, she knows that's wrong. She's written that to me. So she'll hit herself to break the impulse. But her therapists and family have found better ways to keep Carly's impulses in check by listening to music, swimming, even yoga. The one thing she can control is when and where she'll type. Oh, this is John. This is John. And usually she needs to be motivated. Finish up. You're doing great. When I tried making conversation with Carly, she would not type back. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Her finger hovering over the keys for hours until I brought up my teenage son. He wants to play football. No, she's smiling. It's going to be something fun. <laughs> Are you embarrassed? <laughs> Come on, we want to hear what you have to say. Cute. Yes, I guess he's cute. I listen to her probably more than I listen to most other people that I talk to in a given day. She has a tremendous sense of humor. I haven't seen you the whole summer. Hey, hot stuff. 
Did you dress up for me? Whoa, hello. Then there was this recent exchange. Barb, how cute are you? Carly. I'm so cute, blind people stop and stare. It's, you know, two years that we've been communicating, and every time she writes something, there's a little bit of that sense of awe. The room resembled a ship's cabin. Its walls Dear Dad, wooden I love when you read to me, by many coats and I love that you believe in me. I know I'm not the easiest kid in the world. Give me a kiss. However, you are always there for me, me holding kiss. my hand and picking me up. I love you. Okay, I'll go through many sleepless nights to hear that. I'll spend every penny we have to hear that. Was there one writing in particular that left a lump in your throat? In this writing where she says, you've never been in my body, I wish for one day you could be in my body. <sighs> a year after we first met Carly, she is happier, calmer, more independent. Come on, let's get this in the, pan. in the pan. She's even writing a novel. I think that humankind is just oblivious to things that have been around for many years. She also has her own internet blog and Twitters regularly answering questions from people all over North America. I think Carly knows that she now has a voice that can help other kids. Now she looks at herself as someone who can make a mark on the world, and that's got to be life-changing. What do you hope for Carly now? I want her to be happy. I want her to have dreams and goals and accomplish those goals in spite of her challenges. I think the only thing I can say is don't give up. Your inner voice will find its way out. Mine did. Amazing, right? Uh, I just would like to repeat my favorite quote, autism is not a disability, it's a different ability. Let's move on our first topic, teaching students with autism spectrum disorder. As I said before, autism is lifelong developmental disorder beginning in early childhood. Autism is characterized by impairments in three areas, communication, socialization, and behavior. To better understand needs in these areas, let's talk more detail about each of them. I will begin with communication challenges. Children with autism experience difficulties in all areas of communication. Nonverbal, receptive, expressive, and logical interaction are affected. Let's talk about some patterns of language, use, and behavior that are often found in children with ASD. Comprehension. Children with ASD may have difficulty developing language skills and understanding what others say to them. Poor nonverbal conversation skills. Children with ASD often are unable to use gestures, such as pointing to an object to give meaning to their speech. They often avoid eye contact, which can make them seem rude, uninterested, or in a, in a, interactive. Understanding Abstract language. Most individuals with autism have difficulty understanding abstract language, sarcasm, or metaphor. Be aware of statements like, I thought I would die Latin. Maintaining attention, changing focus rapidly. Auditory processing. For example, children with ASD will cover ears in situations that don't seem very noisy for most people, or humming in response to chatter to others' noises. Literal thinking. Kids on the spectrum have a very difficult time understanding when it's polite to say something. For example, when the child sees an obese person, he thinks nothing or informs that lady that she is fat. He also doesn't understand why his statement would cause such a negative reaction. To him, he was simply telling the truth. Limited vocabulary. Echolalia. Repetition of words just spoken by another person. For example, the child may respond to a question by asking the same question. Improper use of pronounced question statements. Unusual tone or rhythm of speech. Some children with ASD speak in a high pitch or sing song voice or use robot-like speech. Relating comments in appropriate situations. Turn taken in a conversation. Now let's talk about behavioral challenges. Many children with autism struggle with behavioral problems. These challenges can be difficult for the child, their parents or caregivers, and their families. 
Behavioral problems often come in the form of aggression, hyperactivity, hurting the, themselves or others. For example, headbanging, hitting, or biting. That's what you saw now at the video. Inappropriate social behavior, for example, undressing in public, or some combination of these or other challenging behaviors. Children with autism may engage in a challenging behavior when they feel unable to express themselves or meet expectations imposed upon them due to underdeveloped skills. The main behavioral challenges are high need for routines and predictability, difficulties with changes and transitions. A transition occurs when a child is requested to change location, activity, environment, or position. Difficulties with processing sensory information. Lack of function use of objects. For example, lining up to a spinning wheel. Usual body movements or repetitive behavior. For example, rocking, flicking fingers. Limited coping strategies. Unflexible thinking. Specific interests. For example, I had a student who would watch videos with the subway trains over and over again. And anxiety challenges. Autistic children and teenagers can experience anxiety more intensely and more often than other children. They may worry or feel stressed about things that are less worrying for typical developing children. This includes things like dealing with unexpected events, difficulties with changes and transitions, adapting to a new situation, understanding responses of others, inability to express oneself. And finally, social interaction challenges. For people with autism, it can be harder to learn and build social, up social skills. Students with ASD often experience challenges with knowing how to initiate an interaction, having difficulties with how to begin and maintain a conversation, recognizing the presence of others, understanding people's feelings and perspective, for example, showing empathy, developing friendship, understanding social rules, for example, how to chat. Now that we have learned about challenges with children's autism experience, let's talk about how to create a safe and predictable environment in your chess classroom. How to set up an autism classroom? Since students with ASD have exceptional needs that other students usually don't, educators must adopt unique educational methods and strategies in order to meet them. The accommodations and support students with ASD receive in the chess classroom will depend on what the individual student requires to be successful. A properly organized classroom can improve skills, achievement and independence and lower stress and anxiety in children with ASD. Here are some tips to help teachers to create the best environment in which students with autism can learn to play chess. Physical layout. Before you start organizing your classroom, pay special attention to physical layout. Think about the flow of students, staff and parents and their transition around the classroom. Furniture arrangements should create physical walkways that will help make transitions smooth and easy. Your classroom will support a maximum a group of four, four students. Get rid of the clutter. Remove unused furniture, materials, or items that don't serve a specific teaching purpose. Many students with autism pay attention to details and may miss the big picture. You don't want them to focus on uh, unrelated items instead of focusing on you. Use visuals to define space. Many students with autism don't understand personal space, so they will benefit from having their specific workplace visually defined. For example, during the lesson, the teacher may not want students to walk around the classroom at any time, so the teacher can use different ways to visually define an area and teach where that area is. A student who has trouble staying on his or her assigned area in the classroom 
may be missed from colored tape on the floor around the spot to establish boundaries, and so the student knows when he or she is expected to be. So not to leave any students out, why not give all other students for state? Use visuals to increase independence. Visual strategies are extremely important tools to help students with ASD to be successful. They help students learn effective communication, positive behavior, and appropriate social interaction. Generally, students with autism are visual learners. They are better at understanding what they see rather than what they hear. That is why they benefit when we use visual strategies to support communication. Visual support helps students to have difficult, who have difficulty understanding or using language to communicate by creating an environment that is more predictable and understandable. Visual support can be pictures, photographs, drawings, objects, written words, schedule, timers, short dance work, or body movement. Label each workstation, shelf, and cabinet with a picture and a corresponding word. If you have a runner in your classroom, you may put a stop sign on the door. A picture is worth a, a, picture, uh, worth a thousand words, so use them. Have a schedule, written, and visual. What is the visual schedule? A visual schedule communicates the sequence of upcoming activities or events using objects, photographs, icons, words, or a combination of visual support. A visual schedule tells the student where they should be and when they should be there and what they will be doing through the day. Refer to the schedule as your student moves through the different activities. Now you can see on the slide some examples of the schedules. Visual schedules are created to match the individual needs of a student and may vary in length and form. You may want to have a different sections of the schedule removable so students know which parts have already been completed and what they still have to do. You can do uh, this by using Velcro tape and laminating the different pieces of the schedule. Keep in mind sensory stimulation. Before I begin talking about sensory accommodations, let's watch one more video. Carly's Cafe experience autism to Carly's eyes. This experience is viewed through the eyes of Carly Flashman, you already know her, a girl living with nonverbal autism. Based on the expert from the book Carly's Voice, Breaking True Autism, it explores how for someone with autism, a simple act like going for a cafe, coffee can descend into the chaos. Carly's Cafe was developed as an interactive video that allows the users to experience autism from inside out. Nadia, can we see video please? Yes, one. Hmm, I can't wait for a coffee. Oh, hello, barista. What do you girls want? Um, skin soy latte. <laughs> Taryn, soy can't be skim. Hot chocolate, orange juice. No, Dad, I want a coffee. Hot chocolate? Great. So I just think I'm going to Sarah's later. Could you give me a ride? Yeah, sure. Are you cool with taking your sister? Yeah. Wait. What? I have my own plan. Carly. Okay, I'll see you tonight, okay?
Sensory challenges are very common with autistic children. Try to minimize sensory stimuli as much as possible. Pay attention to lighting, windows, floor coverings, and ceilings. Even small changes like lowering shades and turning down overhead lights can be helpful. Face desk away from the windows or doors. Fluorescent lighting. Certain type of lighting, especially fluorescent lighting, have been shown to have a particular negative effect on individuals with autism. Approximately half of the autistic individuals experience what is classified as a severe sensitivity to fluorescent lighting. You may reduce light sensitivity by minimizing exposure to fluorescent lighting and replacing it with a direct natural or incandescent lighting, uh, maintaining room with dim lights. Reduce noise. Teacher can use tennis balls on the bottom of the chair to cut down on noise when students are moving their chairs around. In a quieter classroom, students can concentrate better and progress quicker. You also can use carpets to reduce noise level. Have a calm down area. Overstimulation, misunderstanding, or communication breakdowns can easily lead to frustration and even a meltdown. Once students' feelings are escalated, they can no longer learn. Prepare ahead of time for this by creating and setting a common area. This could be a small area in the corner of the classroom with a dim back chair, a container of fidgets, sensory toys, and activities your students enjoy, and some cardboard. The common area should never be used as a form of punishment. Since uh, adding to a visual in um, adding a visual to calm down area to help a student to know when they are calm, add a visual in the calm down area to accept how the student is feeling. Visual that helps students to understand their emotions and visuals with calm down techniques become vital in a calm down area. These visuals will support students as they are developing an understanding of their emotions, and it will also allow them to model the emotional state necessary to return to class. Uh, this is one of the examples when I met uh, that show the techniques and we can create the social story for, for your student. This is one of the examples when I am upset or not hitting social story. You put your child's name. My name is John. My teacher is Natalia and I'm eight years old. And I go to chess school. Sometimes at chess school, I get upset. When I'm upset, I'm not happy. I find it hard to talk when I'm upset. Sometimes when I'm upset, I may hit. This can make my friends and teachers sad. I may, be, I, I may be upset when and add the reason why your child getting upset or angry. My teacher will help me when I'm upset. When I'm upset, I can count to 10. My teacher will help me with this. Next, I can take five deep breaths. Slow in, slow out. Last, I squeeze my hands together. Breathe, relax. Breathe, relax. Counting, breathing, and squeezing my hands make me feel relaxed. This is okay. Soon, I will feel better. This is the just, you, you can be very creative and you can accommodate your social story to your specific student. Okay, let's move on. Uh, there we'll see more examples uh, on our, uh, in our program. Use a timer. Timer is a visual support which helps students with autism see how time process. Plan on who will set the timer, you or your student. When the timer goes off, 
what will be the phrase to decide if the student is ready to go back to work. It could be a simple phrase like, are you ready to go back to work? All these strategies will help you uh, be, to be best prepared for difficult situations and you use your calm down corner effectively. If your students have difficulty staying at their desk, you can use weighted products like a gel weight, lab pad, or snake wrap. Lab pads can be an easy way to help students sit through the lesson or any other activity that requests sitting for a period of time. These kits of, uh, uh, sorry, this kind of products provide common sensory input and comfort, improve attention and concentration, increase body awareness, and have calming benefits. But before using these products, parents should refer to the doctors, occupational therapists, and other professionals to advise on how to better accommodate their child depending on their specific needs. Students will highly benefit from visiting the school and classroom prior to the start of the program. Show them their classroom, restroom, and introduce them to the teacher and staff who will be in the contact with the student. Parents may create a social story to help their kids to make transition easier and more predictable. You can, for example, social story like this daily plan. I am going to chess school. My name is John and I'm eight years old. In September, I will start uh, going to chess school. This is okay. Starting chess school will be fun. On day, you can put day of the week. For example, on Wednesday at five o'clock, my mom, dad, or sister, brother will take me to the chess school. My teacher's name is Natalia. My teacher will teach me how to play chess. First, I will enter the classroom and say hello to my teacher. Then I will go and sit at my desk. I will be quiet and listen to my teacher. After, I will have a break. After the break, I will go back and sit at my desk. I will be quiet and listen to my teacher. When my chess class is finished, dad or mom or sister will take me home again. I will say goodbye to my teacher and friends. I love to come to chess school. It's fun. I will feel happy. Parents may provide the school with copies of the key information about their child's needs and share their, concrete and uh, their concerns and expectations with the staff. Now moving to how do I teach a student with autism? Be positive. Get to know the child. Build positive relationship with the student. Be aware of individual differences. For example, activity level, sensory needs, communicative and cognitive ability. Talk to parents, guardians, previous teachers, consultants. Provide a predictable and safe environment. Minimize transition. Provide accurate prior information about the change. Offer a consistent routine. Provide reinforcement that's individualized and immediate. Be concrete and specific. Avoid using terms like later, maybe, what do you, why do, why do you do that? Ideams, avoid ideams, double meanings and sarcasm. Teach skills in a clear and detailed manner, leaving no room for confusion or doubt. Use modeling and demonstrations with verbalization. Simplify instruction. If necessary for understanding, break a task down into smaller steps that students can accomplish successfully. Keep language simple, concrete, and clear. Pause, 
listen and wait. Watch and listen to attempts to respond. Respond positively to attempts. Use visuals, gestures, signs, pictures, timer, social stories. Allow time to respond. Check for understanding. Find the strengths and needs of the student. Make a list of likes and dislikes. Do not take responses personally. Provide a break to allow for self-regulation. Okay, now we will talk about the strategy teachers can implement during the lesson. Prompting. Prompting is a way of assisting students to perform a specific response after a given construction. Learning new tasks requires effective use of prompts to ensure the person knows how to perform the skill without becoming frustrated and without wasting precious instructional time. Any student with ASD can benefit from prompting during construction regardless of age, communication, skills, or cognitive ability. There are five types of prompts, verbal, indirect verbal and direct verbal, gestural, visual, modeling, and physical. Verbal prompts provide the verbal instructions on what students are to do. An indirect verbal prompt provides a cue that something is expected of the student but very little information is given. For example, what do you do next? A direct verbal prompt is more specific and tells students what is expected. Example, put the chessboard on the desk. Gestural prompts can include such things as pointing, looking at, motioning towards, or moving closer, or touching an item or area to indirect a correct response. Example, teacher points to the chess piece symbol and then to the demo board, gesturing what is expected. Visual prompts include objects, pictures, drawings, or symbols that cue students of what is expected. When given a model prompt, the entire action may be modeled or only a relevant portion of it. For example, the teacher may demonstrate how students should take the chess piece symbol and place it on a demo board. Students will learn through demonstrations. Do, undo, tell students to do it, if wrong, stop, and do it again. Physical prompts include a partial and full physical prompts. A partial physical prompt may be for the teacher, uh, uh, teacher to gently tap the student's elbow to prompt to place the chess piece on the board, on the desk, or the teacher may guide the student's elbow to support placing the chess piece on the board. The most intrusive type of physical assistance would be take the student's hand and physically guide them to place the piece chess on the board to complete the skills. At the top of the pyramid, are the least intrusive prompts, and at the bottom are the most intrusive. When starting out, begin with prompts that are less intrusive. Then move down to the pyramid until your student can complete the task correctly. If an indirect verbal prompt is not effective, try a direct verbal prompt. If that is also ineffective, try a gestural prompt, like pointing or touching an object. Once you find a prompt that is effective, stop. Use at least prompting possible while ensuring your student can perform the task correctly. Then, as your student gets more comfortable with the new skill, you can move up the pyramid to listen to the prompt until they can perform the task independently. This is known as a prompt fading. Some individuals become dependent on the prompts and wait for the teacher to assist them before they make any type of response. To avoid this, prompting should be faded as soon as students begin demonstrating mastery. Next strategy is reinforcement. 
Reinforcement provides external motivation when students are learning a new skill or working hard to manage their behavior. An event that follows behavior and increases the probability of that behavior occurring again is a reinforcer. Whether we realize it or not, our behavior are constantly impacted by reinforcement. It's why we do what we do. We tell a joke to hear the laughter that follows it, or we post something on social media to see who will like or share what we have posted. At its core, reinforcement is motivation. Type of reinforcers. Tangible. Access to a preferred object or a toy. The opportunity to participate in preferred activities. Example. Puzzle, book, video, dinosaur toy, swinging. Social reinforcement. Phrase, high fives, smiles, and notes. Uh, any kind of social acknowledgement. For example, good job, I'm proud of you. Primary. Food and drinks are primary reinforcement because they are meat biological needs. But before turning to food as a motivator for autistic children, it's helpful to understand how eating issues and autism often go hand in hand. Children with ASD may struggle with these problems like inability to recognize hunger, fussiness about types of food, manner of eating, and time or place of eating, difficulty chewing and swallowing certain foods, obsessive eating and drinking when not hungry or thirsty, displays aversion to specific food texture, eats items found on the floor or other location, displays phobias about certain foods, color, texture, smell, etc. Experience biological intolerance to some foods, display non-medical based aversive eating habits like choking, gagging, or excluding. These problems and others may eventually result in medical, physical, and emotional problems, leading to experts to caution parents against using food as a tool to reinforce positive behavior. Here are lots of different other positive reinforcers that teachers can use that are effective and send the right message to our children. To avoid trouble down the road, it makes sense to become familiar with the possible short-term and long-term hazards associated with using food to motivate autistic children. By looking at downside objectively, parents can decide if the motivation brought about by food is strong enough to overweigh the disadvantage. Lack of overall nutrition, failure to thrive when give only favorite foods, vitamin deficiency, increased risk of obesity, unreliable due to fastness over food types and changes for favorite foods. Over time, children may begin to control household food choice. Token. Token have no value by themselves. They are valuable because they can be collected and traded for another type of reinforcement. Example, stickers, check marks, stamps, points. When choosing a reinforcer, pick something you are prepared to give every time you see the behavior and are prepared to withhold it when the behavior doesn't occur. You can't use lunch, snacks, or other necessities of life as a reinforcer. No, no one item is a, a universal reinforcer. Reinforcer are determined by the impact on the behavior. Teaching an autistic child is a difficult process. Each child with autism has different unique needs and we must accommodate them to help child to succeed. We can't measure this success. For some kids with autism and their parents and trainers, success would be the ability to play a game. For others, the ability to recognize chess The teacher must set the goal depending on the student's age and function level. And now Natalia will go on more detail about chess lessons. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, my name is Natalia Popova and I'm an international master and a chess trainer. So before I present an overview of our chess program, I would like to share my experience and tell you how I started uh, because the chess program, it uh, didn't appear out of the blue. It uh, came, it was born from my experience of working with uh, uh, different children. And I think it might be useful to know how we started and what we arrived at and what's the logic behind this program and uh, uh, why we pay so much attention to various nuances. Now you can see how our classroom was uh, organized, was uh, what kind of equipment we have in the classroom. And uh, as we have already mentioned, every child must have an individual workplace. Uh, they must be, sit separately from each other. And between the chess tables, we have empty tables, but there is no empty space. Uh, we did this because children do exercises on the chess board and they also use paper. There are paper-based exercises and very often there is not enough space on one table and uh, chess pieces fall down, it produces noise and it distracts children children, so we put an empty table between the chess tables uh, where children can put their pens, pencils, whatever they need. Another thing I'd like to draw your attention to, you can see one of the uh, break zones, uh, the resting place uh, where they can play board games and it, we didn't introduce board games at the very beginning. We did it during the second year of training uh, because many board games uh, help to strengthen the chess skills, like for instance, uh, put uh, colored figures into a vertical line or horizontal line. Another thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the demonstration board, which was produced used at my request and uh, I have more than 20 years of experience uh, of working with kids and I saw all kinds of demonstration boards that came in different colors. Uh, however, when I work with children with autism, I wanted to uh, introduce the notions of black and white to the maximum extent. So the figures, uh, so the board is uh, black and white and the uh, pieces are black and white with contours with contrasting contours. And this board was produced at my request to facilitate working with uh, autistic children. And we bought similar boards for all other schools working with autistic children. So what we say should be reflected in the picture. When we say white, it should be white and black should be black. That's what I would like to draw your attention to. Uh, then, we also put pillows uh, in their rest zone uh, so the children can sit there and take a rest and relax. Then, uh, speaking about the uh, things I started with, what I thought about when I started teaching chess to autistic children. Uh, when this uh, suggestion came in, I was completely inexperienced uh, in terms of working with ESD children, I had to watch videos, to talk to tutors, and uh, uh, those are the first conclusions I arrived at. Uh, so what I personally started with, I realized that when I explain the material, children will comprehend at uh, various levels. Some will not hear me properly, and there are a lot of children who have issues with listening and understanding speech and grasping what I'm saying. Uh, so we need to make the sentences really short, like, uh, the shortest sentences you can 
uh, produce and with the maximum um, meaning in it, like two or three word sentences uh, that would tell the children what you would like to tell them, uh, not to have extra words that would blur the meaning of what you are saying. Then, uh, for some groups, uh, there should be pauses between words, like we pronounce a short sentence and then make a pause. Uh, and if the children is not quite verbal, has issues with understanding speech, the child should be able to understand what I want to say. Then we use different kinds of uh, memo, uh, of, mem of memorizing approaches. I developed a system of visual cards, uh, as Ala mentioned earlier, and uh, other speakers as well. One picture speaks loud, louder than a thousand words. So there should be uh, cards, visual cards, to support what you are saying in every list. Uh, then we, uh, I also tried to use physical exercises to learn the material. Uh, then uh, I had uh, four children with ASD in my group, and of course, there it was a group lesson. But we, need, we must understand that within this group class, we still pay individual attention individually to every student, and uh, individual work was the main component during the first stages of work. Every like paying attention and allocating time to every child. Um, I also wanted to uh, have them interested and make the lessons uh, in crossing. Then another very important point, um, um, oh, however great the teacher is, uh, if the child doesn't do anything at home, doesn't repeat the lessons material at home, the children will not grasp the material. They simply forget everything. And the next time they come completely unaware of what we did at the previous lesson. So we are to be in contact with parents. And uh, with by, when I say parents, I mean all the child's uh, representatives and I know that when uh, parents can't help some get uh, brothers sisters or other relatives involved to help the ch the child do the home task if the if the parents uh, can't do that if they can't help with the home task so doing home task is of key importance and now uh, let's move on to the program, why, why and how it was uh, created, what we relied on, and uh, what uh, were the key components of, the, of this program and what we paid our attention to. So the first key point is that our uh, program is uh, composed of topics, not lessons. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, impossible to split a program for children with ASD into lessons. I can't uh, write a scenario for every lesson and uh, be sure that we will be able to complete a certain portion of material within a lesson. So we split the program into topics, not lessons. And every topic uh, can be completed uh, in a different tempo by different groups and different children. Uh, however, uh, we split children into groups, uh, taking into account their abilities and the, uh, comprehend the material at their own pace. So uh, we have to accept the way it goes in every group. Like one group needs that much time and the other needs that much time. Then uh, another important point is uh, uh, splitting 
the material into the simplest elements and to move on from the simplest elements to more complicated ones. And this way we can see how well the children grasp the material, but to keep them interested and to have positive emotions, they are the children are, must be able to complete the simplest tasks. Uh, then we uh, stimulate this way we stimulate children and they are positive about their achievements like uh, wow I can do that uh, so you, we have to uh, give them the very simplest exercises and then move on to more complicated ones of course we include some uh, uh, physical activities, as I mentioned earlier, some uh, exercises to develop their cognitive uh, skills, and I'll uh, speak about that later. I'll uh, also include great uh, exercises in, her, in the program. So that's how we built it to keep the children interested. Then, so what to begin with? Uh, the, the hardest thing for me uh, was when I entered the class and uh, the children that were sitting there, they were different from the ones I met before, and that my experience of working with all kinds of children will not work here. So what can I begin with? Uh, uh, I had experience of working with children of all ages without ASD. I understood how I can, how I could build the lesson, how I could involve emotions and introduce dialogues, etc. But uh, uh, here I understood that none of that would work. So my first words. Uh, my first question to myself was, how can I get them involved and start the lesson? I had to think, and I would like to share my experience. As Alla mentioned earlier, there is a social story uh, when whereby parents prepare children to going to a chess school, to attending a chess class, and uh, as this social story, we uh, sent the parents uh, pictures of the school all of the classrooms so that they could take a look and of course there were chess pieces in those in those photos uh, so that children could, could hear the word chess and the word game while they're still at home if they do not understand the word chess they would understand the word game uh, they could see some objects that resemble a chess board. They could see chess pieces with their own eyes. And this way, their parents prepared the children to attending a chess class. Uh, so uh, that gave some sort of preparation for the chess class. And uh, based, so based on that, I found some hints for myself. Uh, however, I had two groups that uh, had uh, uh, severe issues understanding speech, and I had to speak in short sentences and uh, uh, with pauses. However, start the lesson. I had to start the lesson and get them involved. Uh, so uh, I will later get back to visual cards that I have for every topic because I support all my uh, phrases with visual cards. And I'll tell you about other functions of the cards. But now the opening words. Hello, my name is Natalia. I am Natalia. Uh, that's, that way I get acquainted with them. And the first uh, uh, phrase was, do you like to play? Yes, they like they usually like to play some answer to me some said quietly so um, by saying that i go i grasped their attention like what uh, then i asked what games do you like to play i used short sentences with a few words so they got involved some recalled physical games some recalled uh, um 
games on the smartphone. And then I proceeded to say that there's a, such a game as chess. Uh, to play chess, we need a board, we need chess pieces. I, I had uh, uh, the headboards on their tables, and uh, that's why we started learning the chess board. So I drew their attention to the fact that we need a chess board to play chess. I'll teach you to, che to play chess. So studying the chess board is the first topic. And to tell the truth, is it is a very challenging topic and something to be paid attention to. You shouldn't rush through this topic because uh, based on how well they study the lines and these the spaces, uh, this will create a foundation for further learning and you won't be able to progress without that because otherwise they won't learn how pieces move. Um, uh, so I introduced the notions of horizontal, vertical, and uh, diagonal lines at the very beginning. Why did I do that? So here are examples of visual cards. Why did I start with those notions? Because many children came without uh, uh, proper orientation in this space. They couldn't tell uh, the uh, top from the bottom, like moving forward from moving back. Right and left were also challenging notions for them. And so we started moving uh, on the chessboard from the very beginning. So once again, I faced uh, the fact that children lack uh, spatial um, spatial orientation, like forward, backwards, up, down. Uh, it might be complicated for them. And uh, I started showing those lines on the chessboard with those words. It's, it might be hard, but gradually through a thousand repetitions, as I call this method, we learned these notions of horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines. But let's get back to visual cards. I wanted to tell you about the function of visual cards, how they help me, and why they are so helpful for the kids. I prepare all visual cards, uh, uh, and to laminate them for every child. And uh, every child has a set of visual cards. They take the cards with them. They take the cards home. So what is, what is their main function? Uh, so uh, they can use those cards with their parents then uh, they say, why do I have to do that? I don't want to do it this way, I want to do it that way. So this card uh, demonstrates a rule. We can say that, look, this is a rule. It is a laminated card, which is strong and reliable. So this is a rule. And we learn to play by the rules. This is how we're going to play. So their first function is uh, uh, revising the material at home. And the second function is presenting the rule. So all visual cards for each, for each topic, I have a presentation. Yes, we will share it. Uh, so we have those cards for every lesson. Um, and we, uh, of course, we start uh, we, we start from the uh, with the squares, uh, with saying that the board itself is square, is square, and telling them that the squares are can be bright and dark. I don't introduce the notions of uh, black and white from the very beginning because the children's boards are dark, uh, are brown and uh, uh, yellowish. 
So we operate with bright and dark at the very beginning. And then I say that dark squares are called black squares and bright squares are called white squares. And the same way we work with figure with pieces. Uh, so we have uh, those this kind of visual cards for the first lesson. Uh, so this is a set for each child. Many brought that the brought, many bring back the cards to the lesson and they work as prompts. It's a good thing if a child knows where the prompt where they can uh, peep uh, to see a prompt because they may not remember something by heart. So these are paper-based exercises. Uh, the exercises we do in class. So why do we complement lessons with that? This also helps the children to revise material with their parents uh, when they receive the home task they can understand what children do in class and they can work with these exercises at home like color the horizontal vertical and diagonal lines and color the pieces so these are exercises that children can do with their parents at home and parents don't need any specialized knowledge for that uh, so doing at least some tasks uh, on paper is really important because um, at home it helps children to revise the lessons with their parents. So here are the visual cards. Uh, uh, they uh, carry those cards with children carry those cards with them for a long time. Uh, because those cards demonstrate what the uh, pieces are like on the blackboard and what they look like on my demonstration board uh, and what they look like in uh, books. So it's really important and Allah will show you a great exercise about that. Uh, so these cards show the difference between the pieces on the board, on the demonstration board and in books. Then this is a card uh, that demonstrates the initial position uh, and uh, placing the pieces correctly. Uh, it's it's a really sim a simple topic because they can grasp it with their visual memory. Uh, and I didn't have any issues with that uh, topic. So now I will give the floor to Allah uh, to introduce the great exercises uh, she has for the starting topics. Uh, okay. Our first lesson. Uh, what 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 I was talking about? You you have to uh, not not have to, but it's, will benefit your classroom if you label the boards or equipment you have around the classroom. And there you see you labeled with chessboard and demo board. And let's move to first activity. As sorting colors, uh, what Natalia said was very important uh, to understand the colors, black and white, or uh, light and dark. And first activity is sorting colors, black and white, ball recognition of white, light color and black dark color squares on the chessboard. You will need three containers, black and white squares, pictures with the word white and black. And the steps will be mix black and white squares, as you see on the first slide. Label two containers with the picture, the picture of the word white and the picture of the word black. Place black and white squares next to the board. Place containers in front of students. Get students' attention. Ask students to sort items. Prompt with a phrase like, put with the same. 
if students uh, students are verbal, ask them to name the color while sorting. Use modeling or hand over hand strategy if needed. Reinforce students. Okay, and now we are moving to our lesson two. Uh, students with autism often need simple and individualized practice to master skill of sorting and matching before moving on to more difficult activities. Sorting. Sorting activities help children to develop important cognitive skills, problem solving, critical and logical thinking, language development. Students will learn words that describe items they sort. Practicing sorting also helps to develop early math skills. Matching. Matching activities help students learn the names of the objects, their descriptions, teach them visual discrimination, what is the same and different, ability to organize information, identify patterns. As a sorting, matching skills are also important for language development, problem solving, and critical thinking. Sorting and matching activities help students to improve concentration and increase attention to details, increase short-term memory, and train visual memory, develop and improve fine motor skills. The teacher should use different teaching approaches depending on the level of support the students need. For example, the teacher can model first, start sorting matching, and then ask students to continue. The teacher also can use a hand over hand strategy, help students to sort by holding their hands. If you teach a high functioning student, you can skip some activities. Activity one, sorting chess pieces. Goal, recognition of chess pieces. You will need three containers, chess pieces, items of your choice, blocks, buttons, marbles. I choose the buttons for this activity. Mix chess pieces with the items of your choice. As an example, I will use buttons in one container. Label two other containers with the picture, the picture of chess piece and the picture of the other item. Or you can attach actual items. Pla uh, place container on front of the student. Get the student's attention. Ask students to sort items. Prompt with the phrase last, put with the same. Use modeling or hand over hand strategy if needed. Reinforce students. Activity two, sorting chess pieces based on color, black and white. Goal, recognition of white, light color and black, dark color chess pieces. Materials, three containers, set of chess pieces. Step, mix black and white chess pieces in one container, label to other containers with the picture, the picture of the white chess piece and the picture of the black piece, uh, chess piece, or you can attach an actual item, as you see on my slide. Place containers in front of the student, get students' attention, ask students to sort items. Prompt with the phrase, like put is the same, if students uh, is verbal, ask him or her to color uh, uh, to name the color while they sort. For example, you you put the white figure and say white and black. Just keep repeating. So we'll master the skill. Use modern or hand over hand strategy if needed and reinforce the student. Matching. Teaching. Matching in the order, uh, teach matching in the order you will teach pieces. Rook, knight, bishop, queen, king, and pawn. Activity one, object to object, 3D to 3D matching. Matching chess pieces. The goal is recognition of 3D chess pieces and their name. Materials, you will need at least two of each chess pieces. 
steps. Get the student's attention. Choose a 3D chess piece. Place the piece in front of the student. Place two other pieces behind. One of them should be identical to the piece you want students to match. Name the piece. This is the rook. Ask students to find an identical piece. Find the same. Prompt with a phrase like put with the same, match with the same, match with the rook. If students are verbal, ask to repeat the name of the piece. Make sure students match the piece correctly. Use modeling and hand over hand strategies if needed. Reinforce students. Start with one color. When the student is able to correctly match one 3D piece, keep adding more pieces for students to choose from, and then mix white and black pieces. Activity 2. Object to picture matching. Matching 3D chess piece to the picture card with the symbol of the chess piece. Goal recognition of 3D chess pieces, their symbolic representation, and their name. Students develop symbolic representation. For example, a picture represents an object, material, set of chess pieces, picture cards with symbols of chess pieces, work with Velcro. And steps. Place a 3D chess piece, for example, a rook, and the board in front of the student. Ask student to find the picture with the symbol of the piece. Prompt with a phrase like put with the same, put the rook with the rook, find the same, match with the name of the piece. In our case, it's a rook. If students are verbal, ask to repeat the name of the piece. Make sure students match the object and picture correctly. Use modeling and hand over hand strategies if needed. Reinforce the student. When students have mastered matching 3D chess piece to the picture cards, move to the next activity. Activity 3 Picture to object matching. Matching the picture card with the symbol of the chess piece to the 3D chess piece. Goal. Recognition of 3D chess pieces, their symbolic representation, and their names. Students develop understand symbolic representation. For example, a picture represents an object. Material. Set of chess pieces. Picture cards with symbols of chess pieces. Board with Velcro. Steps. Place the board with the symbol picture of the chess piece in front of the student. Place few 3D chess pictures uh, chess, chess pieces behind. One of them should be identical to the symbol picture you want students to match. Ask students to find the 3D piece, in our example rule, to match with the picture. Prompt is the phrase like put with the same, put rook with the rook, find the same, match with the rook. If students are verbal, ask to repeat the name of the piece. Make sure students match an object and picture correctly. Use modeling and hand over hand if needed. Reinforce the student. Activity 4. Picture to picture matching. Matching the picture card with the image of the real chess piece to the picture with the symbol of the chess piece. Goal, recognition of symbols representing chess pieces. Material, picture cards with the image of the actual chess pieces. Picture cards with the symbol of chess pieces. Work with Velcro. Steps, get students' attention. Place one picture card with the image of the actual chess piece in front of the student. Place few 3D pictures with the symbols of chess pieces beside. One of the pictures should represent the symbol of the piece you want students to match. Ask students to find the identical picture with the symbol. 
prompt with the phrase like put with the same, put the roof with the roof, find the same, match with the roof. If students are verbal, again ask to repeat the name of the piece. Make sure students match the object and picture correctly, use modeling and hand over hand strategies if needed, reinforce the students. Keep adding pictures cards to master the recognition. Uh, Nadia, can we see the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. Activity five, picture to picture matching. Matching the picture cards with the image of the actual chess piece and the picture with the symbol of the chess piece to the card with the word text and representing the piece. Goal, recognition of chess piece symbols and their word representation. Nadia, can you please move to the next slide? Thank you. Materials. We will need picture cards with the image of an actual chess piece, picture cards with the symbol of chess pieces, picture cards with the word representing piece, word with Velcro. Get the student's attention, place one picture card with the image of the actual chess piece or the symbol in the front of student. Place a few pictures with the word besides. One of the pictures should represent the name of the piece you want students to match. Uh, Nadia, can you please move to the next slide? Thank you. Ask students to find the identical picture with the word. Prompt with the phrase like, Put with the same, put the roof with the roof, find the same, match with the roof. If students are verbal, again ask to repeat the name of the piece. Make sure students match features correctly, use modeling and hand over hand strategies if needed, reinforce students. Keep adding picture cards to master the recognition. Nadia, can you please? Uh, for the next slide. After mastering recognition of the pieces and picture of one color, for example, black, move to the other color. Okay, this is the end of the lesson two. Uh, it may uh, seem like <laughs> very complicated, but it is very easy. You can go to our program and just to the pictures and or you create your own okay just a second please thank you okay Okay, activity one, goal, understanding of algebraic notation, which uses a single letter and number to name each square of the chessboard. Material, chessboard of your choice. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, yes, if it's correct. Uh, Right, yes, just board of your choice, personal demo or sheet with the board image, picture cards with the letters from A to H. If the chessboard has capital letters on it, use cards with the capital letters. Picture cards with the numbers from one to eight. First, then board with Velcro. Steps, get the student's attention, place token on the board. You will see, I don't know if you can see there, but there's yellow token on the board. Ask student to find the picture with the letter of the square and place it under the word first. Ask student to find the number of the square and place it under the word then. Prompt with the phrase, first a letter, then a number. If students are verbal, ask to read the notation. Reverse the task. Place cards with the letter and number on the board and ask students to place a token 
on the correct square on the board. Make sure students choose the right cards and place them on the board correctly. Use modeling hand over hand strategies if needed. Reinforce students. Activity 2. Picture to picture matching. For this activity, use advanced matching, matching similar but not identical picture cards. Students will match three pictures. A picture with the word text representing the chess piece, a picture with the abbreviation, and a picture with the symbol of the chess piece. The goal, recognition of chess pieces symbol, their word text representation, and their abbreviation. Materials. Picture cards with the symbol of chess pieces. Picture cards with the words representing pieces. Picture cards with the abbreviation of chess pieces and board with Velcro. Steps. Get the student's attention as usual. Place one picture card with the image of the chess piece symbol in front of the student. Place picture with the word and abbreviation of the uh, piece beside. Ask student to find the identical picture with the word and abbreviation, prompt with the phrase like put with the stain, put the rope with the rope, find the stain, match with the rope. If students are verbal, ask to repeat the name of the piece. When students have mastered matching one photo card to the two other photo cards, you can add more photo cards to match. You also can change the order. For example, choose the picture card with an abbreviation of the chess piece and ask to match with the card with the symbol and word card. Make sure students match cards correctly, use modeling and hand over hand strategies if needed to reinforce the student. Keep adding cards to master their cognition. Activity 3. As with each square for a chess board, each chess piece also needs to be referred to by some notation. Understanding chess notation. Materials. Chess board of your choice, personal demo or sheet with the board image. Picture cards with the abbreviations of chess pieces. Picture cards with the letter from A to H. Picture cards with the numbers from 1 to 8. Board with Velcro. Steps. Get the student's attention. Place a chess piece symbol on the board. Place picture cards with abbreviations, letters, and numbers beside the Velcro board. At the beginning, you can have only cards which represent notation on the chessboard. Ask students to put them in order. Prompt with question. What piece do you see? Knight. Which letter represents the piece? Which letter represents the knight? And I apologize, there is uh, a mistake on the slide. Uh, there's N instead of K. Uh, prompt with the phrase like take a K and place on the board. Which letter represents the square with the knight? Take C and place on the board. Which number represent the square with the knight? Take six and place on the board. Make sure students place pictures in correct order. Use modeling and hand over hand strategies if needed. Reinforce students. And now we are moving to our lesson four. Activity one, <clears throat> understanding chess piece value. Materials, picture cards with the symbol of chess pieces. Picture cards with numbers one, three, five, and nine. Nine picture cards with the symbol of pawn. Sheet with the symbol and their value. Board Velcro. 
get the student's attention. Place one picture card with the symbol of the chess on the Velcro board. Place cards with symbols, numbers, form pieces, and sheets with the Velcro beside. A sheet with the value of the pieces beside. Prompt with the phrase like, find the number which represents the value of the piece. How much does the rook cost? Ask student to place the card with the number next to the symbol. Prompt with the phrase like, how many points pawns does the rook cost? Ask student to place five cards with the pawn on the board. Make sure students choose the right cards and place them on the board correctly. Use modeling or hand over hand strategy if needed to reinforce the student. You also can change the order. For example, choose a number card and ask to match with the card to the symbol and form. If needed, break the task into smaller parts. Start with one symbol and cards which represent only this symbol. Example, symbol of bishop, a card with number three and the three cards with four. Thank you. And now Natalia will continue. So thank you once again, Ala, for a, a great set of exercises that really help children to uh, master those topics. And I would like to draw your attention uh, to uh, the last topic, the value of pieces, uh, you saw that, saw that there was a uh, uh, rook and uh, five pawns, like uh, you can change three pawns for a rook, uh, and uh, so they will understand the value of uh, chess pieces. The same way you can uh, play with the bishop, like for instance, exchange for nine pawns. So uh, not all children manage to uh, master those interconnections, but at a certain point, we may arrive at an understanding of how many points a piece costs. And uh, so every child has a visual, set of visual cards so that they can revise the material at home. Just a moment, yes. So, so another set of cards uh, that I prepare that where they have all the material, uh, how are we uh, about chess notation? Why is this uh, topic among the first ones? First of all, according to my experience, children grasp uh, letters and numbers very quickly. They understand this topic really well, and it helps uh, uh, to study the material and understand the chess board better, uh, and it's easier for them this way. So when you study a certain piece, you will be able to operate the names of uh, squares. They may understand this topic slowly, but still. Uh, so, for instance, I tell them to take the rook and put it on c4, and uh, then I ask them to explain how the rook moves. So it moves horizontally, and we revise. Uh, so we revise the topic once again, and it helps me to explain the material better. If the child is nonverbal, then we work with the help of visual cards and use the exercises developed by Allah, it helps to uh, present the material better. So we explain that we have numbers from one to eight and letters. Uh, so the, let, the names of those letters sound differently in different countries, uh, but we use the pronunciation that is widely spread in our country. So these are the visual cards. 
Then I'd like to uh, come back to the topics of vertical, horizontal, and diagonal lines. Uh, so how do we work with them? We involve uh, uh, demonstration, the demonstration boards. I teach the children from the very beginning uh, to concentrate on the demo board. It's really hard. Uh, the uh, their span of concentration is really tiny. It's like uh, seconds. Uh, then we do something on the demo board, and then they get back to their personal boards. And I move from child to child. Of course, tutors help me with that. I do not work alone um, to cover all four children because otherwise the children will get dull. So step by step, by teaching them to concentrate a demo board, well, I increase their concentration span. And for instance, um, at a certain point with one group, we were able to work on the demo board for 10 minutes. Uh, they wrote down the answers in their notebooks. So it was very much like working with uh, uh, working with, uh, uh, with uh, children in, in general. Uh, but at the very beginning, we started with uh, 10 or 15 seconds. And then we increased this uh, span of attention. And this, so when working with horizontal and vertical lines, I told that I uh, used uh, green magnets and red magnets. So when we show how the piece moves, we, uh, we lay out the move with these uh, colored magnets. magnets. Uh, so I use the association with the uh, with the street lights, like where the green light is, we can move, and where the red light is, we can't move. Just a second, please. Just a second, I have many presentations open. So then we move on to studying the pieces, how they move, how the piece moves, how it uh, captures other pieces and how the piece attacks. Uh, it is a really complicated topic, how the piece attacks. But why do I introduce this notion from the very beginning? when we study how the piece moves, for instance, the rook, the bishop, uh, the knight, the pawn, the king, how they move. The next topic would be uh, the uh, like uh, check. And I need to take them to this point that uh, check is an attack on the king and uh, uh, of course, they can't grasp it from the very beginning. So I introduce it uh, in, in steps. So like pieces can attack, they attack this way and that's, that way. And when they approach the notion of check, uh, like the check will be an attack on the king. Uh, so it will be uh, clearer for the children what this term means. So gradually we take them to this notion to check and we won't need to introduce a new kind of attack. So it will be an attack on a king. This is why when we study a piece, we study how it moves, uh, how it uh, captures uh, other pieces and how it attacks. Please do not exclude this exercise, although it might be complicated. So uh, like you have to move this way and attack this way, that an attack is not uh, capturing. Uh, so it's my, it might be hard, but you need to introduce this notion. Why is the program built this way? Why do we start with the rook? 
moves it moves uh, along straight lines and this is the easiest uh, thing probably to study some start with the king but i can't imagine how a child with and with autism can understand that it can move this way and attack that way. And there is an person and uh, this is uh, really difficult. So as I mentioned, the program starts with the simple things and moves to the harder ones. Uh, that uh, the king, uh, like a certain piece cannot attack a different piece that is protected. We have to introduce a lot of notions. Uh, and this is why we start with the rook. And uh, then according to the lines that we studied at the very beginning, the horizontal, the vertical, and the diagonal lines, we move on. Just a second, I'll try to launch presentation with the visual cards for this topic. For some reasons, I can't see them. I don't know. Although they were open. I can see all the sets of cards besides the ones I need. Ah, there they are. So I can't. So you see, that's how we work on the on the demo board and then on the individual boards and on the visual cards to make it clear uh, for them where the rook can go and which squares they can go to. Uh, so we demonstrated with the green uh, circles. Then, of course, we remove the green circles and uh, we move the rook around the board. And I help kids if they uh, don't manage themselves. We can use the hand over hand method. But if children don't let us touch their hands, uh, uh, they uh, then I can move the piece for the child but, and then ask them to repeat this move. So uh, there are a lot of exercises in the uh, program and you can see it on, the, on our website. So these are the visual cards I give to the children and at home parents can uh, demonstrate the same position on the board and check how well the child comprehends uh, the uh, less comprehended the lesson. And uh, of course, at the lesson, it is all uh, presented and we work through this at the lesson, but at home parents can practice once again with their children. Um, then I'd like to show an exercise for cap that shows capturing when we capture a piece, we replace the captured piece with our piece and the captured piece is removed from the board. And uh, two comments here, two important things. Uh, one is that we can't capture the king. So please teach these from the very beginning. So with no exercises where we capture the king. So like uh, we capture in some exercises, we capture the king, the king is dead, hooray. No, in those exercises, we uh, do not introduce the notion of check and mate. And so we do not capture the king. And the hardest thing that I, that I insist on it from the very first capture, capturing that you learn with the kids. Uh, they need to do it with one hand, not like one taking the one piece with one hand, the other piece with the other hand. There is, it is probable that some children with will like chess that they will want to participate in competitions and if we do not develop the skill of uh, proper capturing with uh, one hand well uh, 
they will not be able to participate in the competition play if they capture with two hands uh, and they uh, will uh, get distress they will get stressed because of that so if the child can do the capturing with one hand they should do it if not that we uh, they must move their piece to the to the piece they are capturing and then remove uh, the captured piece from the board so we need to teach them uh, to piece to do the capturing with one hand then uh, to the interchanges with one hand and en passant with one hand all of that must be done with one hand of course it will be hard uh, they won't be able to do it at the very beginning uh, then approaching the pieces and removing the pieces will be done like this uh, we need to explain that they shouldn't do that no we don't do that uh, so uh, we also need to ask the parents to practice capturing with one hand at home it must it might be hard but everyone can do it depending on their motor skills uh, they will manage to do it somehow with one hand so please pay uh, be sure to pay attention to that of course not uh, every kid can progress to the competitions level but still so this is the way the uh, piece attacks another visual card we need to introduce this notion gradually and they will uh, get it. The same applies to the bishop, um, but uh, the bishop moves diagonally. Allah showed a great exercise with squares, with white squares and black squares. One of the ways to uh, finalize the topic with uh, with the diagonal lines and vertical lines, we can do it through associations, through parallels. Yes, it might be hard, but still. You know, we have the bishop in the white field and bishop in the black fields. Uh, so we. We move on with studying the pieces. If I may, I'd like to stress one more point and explain it just a couple of minutes uh, it's clear that i won't dwell on studying the pieces for too long but the program also includes defense as a topic what is defense and why after studying the pieces how they move how they attack uh, they will need attacking when we you will study the king where the king can move oh, you don't have the notion of check but you start discussing the king you can use the notion of attack and then we come to defense and before we int before I introduce the uh, check i tell them about defense how we can uh, how the piece can escape how it can def be defended and you need to work with this topic uh, before you arrive at the at the notion of check so you have to revise the piece you, this way you revise the pieces and uh, introduce the time the defense and the types of defense because as soon as you start with the check as a notion then you will uh, you will also come to defend to defense against the check so you shouldn't skip this topic it allows to revise how pieces move and introduce the ways of defending and defense as a notion and also so i i will skip the individual cards and we also have 
the uh, rules of behavior at the uh, chess board. I think Allah has it, but I will say, still say a couple of words, just show you a couple of pictures, how our lessons uh, happen. Of course, at the very beginning, we don't film anything. We don't take pictures because this makes this may disrupt the lesson. But then we started uh, filming the lessons, and I want to draw your attention to the fact that in the corner on my table, I always have a timer. We our lesson lasts fifty minutes, and that this uh, par part of the circle is highlighted in red and it's important for them to see how much time is left and we have a smiling face in the middle it shows the break sometimes i work with a pad and i can explain things individually so we have uh, we have some tasks on the paper and they imitate this position on the board and the, do the tasks on the board. They also work individually on demonstration boards, on the demonstration board. So, so this is all I wanted to tell. Of course, I'd like to tell more. So the behavior at the board is uh, really interesting, and I'd like to give the floor to Allah. Um, we're going to show you the social story. Uh, as we said, the predictability is the like key to your successful day. And uh, at some point, your students will play the game. Uh, parents or you, you can create the social story. I'm going to share. Yes, that's going to be your social story, your book. Today, I will play game of chess. Before the game begins, shake hands and say good luck. You remember our first presenter, uh, Eugenia said that uh, it's, it was a challenge to make her student to shake the hand. But parents can practice it at home before go. You can read over and over the um, uh, the book, the social story, and also you you can try to master it in your classroom. Before the game begins, shake the hands and say good luck. During the chess match, remain quiet and concentrate on your game. Think before you touch. If you touch one of your own pieces, then you must move it. Remember, every move must be made with one hand only. If you want to touch a piece because it fell down or it moved from the, its square, tell your opponent, I adjust. During the game, you will use a chess clock. Every move, you will press the button on the clock on your side. When your opponents make a move, they will press the button on their side. You must press your clock with the same hand you made the move. At the end of the game, shake hands and say, good game. You can be creative and you can, you know, accommodate your story to your particular student. And one more social story. This will be the last one. It's okay not to win. You know, uh, even like all, all, all children don't like to lose. But it's going to be a challenge to prepare for this, your autistic student. It's okay not to win. And... Say, my name is Alex, my teacher is Miss M, I'm 10 years old, and I go to chess school. And you can put the picture of the child. I like to play games with my friends. We must take turns to be the winner. Sometimes I'm the winner. This makes me happy. I can say good time, good game, sorry, 
or what was that was fun. Sometimes I'm not the winner. It is my friend's turn to win. This makes me feel sad or sometimes mad. This is okay. I can say I feel sad I didn't win or maybe I will win next time. I can say to my friend that was a good game. This will make my friend feel happy. My friend will like playing with me. This will make me feel happy. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm going to present um, uh, our last speaker for today. It's Kansi Devli Sarger. She is a speech and language therapist of the Brown School from South Africa. Uh, Kansi is uh, realizing FIDE pilot uh, project Infinite Chess in South Africa from uh, January of this year. And now uh, she will share with us her uh, own practical experience. Kansi, please. Hi everyone, I'm sure you are all exhausted. I hope not to be too long. Um, so just a brief history of our school. Uh, it's the Brown School that's situated in Durban, uh, KwaZulu-Natal. It's a special school, so it's, it's uh, caters for special needs children, children that have uh, autism, uh, cerebral palsy, and learning disabilities. Um, so we were very excited to be part of this uh, project because there was definitely a need to get our kids involved in something uh, uh, different and to get them more social. And uh, I had already introduced chess to children with autism and I had already seen some very positive results. So when uh, we were approached by the Infinite, uh, Infinite Chess Project, we were super excited because now we would have some direction. And also the fact that it was evidence-based, it gave us good support in actually working with our children. Um, just one minute. So the initial process was uh, definitely getting our parents' uh, consent because we had to get permission for videoing and taking photos. And uh, it was important that the parents actually knew and what was required of them. And we were very happy to get very positive feedback. We didn't have any kids that were not involved in the project. All the kids that were targeted, we had positive responses. Our selection criteria for the kids were uh, that uh, the learners must be between the ages of eight to 12 years. Uh, the academic language competency was at uh, grade one level and above. They were all medically well managed in terms of behavior and attending skills. They were all definitely, I had the diagnosis of ASD from a medical professional. Parent consent was requested before the commencement of this project. And they had to have a keen interest in chess. I kind of had some idea about that because we had approached chess before. Uh, parents were well informed regarding their child's participation and what was required from parents as well in terms of providing feedback. Uh, teachers were also informed regarding the details of their project and uh, their, that their feedback was important. It was also important for teachers to be on board in terms of allocating a lesson to us for uh, chess. So our classes commenced on the 11th of February uh, the Thursday group consists of seven children aged between uh, nine and 11 years old. Uh, and there were two groups held on Friday. The first one had 11 children that were aged between uh, eight to 10 years. And group two consists of eight children between the ages of eight, uh, 11 and 13. At the end of March, 2022, we had two additional children join the program. And that was from feedback uh, so obviously kids were talking to other kids and the, uh, these two particular children were not from our autistic uh, sector of the school. They were, moved, they were from the mainstream, that's the adapted CAPS curriculum uh, sector of the school. And because they also heard about this program, they really were keen uh, to be added as well. Uh, just to note that because it's a timetabled uh, lesson, it could only be 30 minutes. And you will see that having a 30 minutes uh, lesson has its uh, down, its pitfalls and has its limitations as well. 
Um, it was definitely at, uh, where was it held? At the Brown School. There was a dedicated room that was um, uh, created. And uh, just to note that this room actually is the chess room for, for the school. So children from the mainstream sectors also takes part in, in this, uh, uh, or does the chess in this room. So it's very difficult to create a, 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 an environment that is not very visually bombarding or uh, just to have eight desks in a lesson when we have about 40 children come into the room at a time when we're doing chess with, other, with the other groups. So um, it was difficult to actually kind of, uh, you know, fulfill all the requirements that was, uh, that was part of this project. The equipment, we had a demo board, we had a floorboard, whiteboard with whiteboard markers, um, the infinite, uh, project program, the workbook, laminated photos of chess pieces and how they moved, uh, social stories on the introduction of chess pieces. Each child was given an exercise book in order to stick in the homework and, communi and communication between the parent and teacher was encouraged through this book. Also note that we do not have direct contact with the parents as it's part of the school uh, day. So communication was through this, uh, via this exercise book, as well as WhatsApp groups and telephone calls. Um, I had to put glue here because it's very important to have your proper stationery. Glue is one of the things that kids never bring or it gets finished too quickly and can cause quite a bit of bother in your lesson. So it's very important that each child ha have their own stationery. Um, a pencil, a timer, stickers for us was definitely a big thing uh, as the children loved uh, getting rewards uh, after they had done something successfully. And we were still in COVID time, so had a hand sanitizer and surface sanitizer wear a must. Um, we used the methodological um, guide for teachers to conduct the chess lessons when working with children with, aut uh, with autism spectrum disorder. It was the main guide for planning and delivery of our chess lessons. It provides well thought out hierarchical guidelines as to how to introduce chess to children with autism and practical exercises and, uh, and worksheets that accompanied each lessons actually provided both the child and parent with support. And here it was like a lifeline for us, for our parent and child, because sometimes you would get a parent write, uh, writing there, um, he really loved this lesson, or it, it, the, this concept is quite difficult for him, or I can't believe I didn't even ask him to do his homework and he did it. So um, it was very good that we had some kind of feedback um, from that. So getting started, we know that the research indicated that children on the spectrum benefited most from a room that's organized and less distracted. So we had to evaluate our room. We tried to have minimal furniture and have uh, clearly marked areas. We, uh, our dedicated chess room was, as I said before, was used both for the mainstream sector and the children with autism. Um, they were definitely verbally prepared regarding the lessons. So on their visual schedules in the classroom, chess was uh, uh, a picture communication symbol that was included there just to know their days and their times when they were coming. And also the teacher had pre prepared beautiful uh, cover pages for their chess books. So it was color coded that this, in this lesson, this is the book they will take for chess. Being a speech therapist, you had to also employ your therapeutic techniques. So uh, it was very important to ensure that the environment was conducive to learning. So as everyone mentioned before, the sensory uh, issues were accommodated by making sure that the lighting was suitable for the children. It was fluorescent lighting, but we had included blocked out curtains just to make it, uh, uh, to make it warmer in terms of uh, the lighting. Each child was comfortable when they were seated. Some children preferred to sit right in front, some preferred to sit in the corners of the room. So it was important for me to note that. Um, I had to check the, ch uh, the children's level of tolerance to the noise of the fans. Uh, even my voice, my tone and loudness, I had to accommodate. So even though some research is indicating the importance of affect when you are delivering a lesson, I had to make sure that certain children are 
fine with the way I deliver because sometimes you do want to exaggerate and make things really, really exciting, but it might be too much of a sensory overload for some children. So it's very important for me to have that keen observation to see if I, my delivery is fine for each child. Uh, I had to write dress code because it's very important to know that you are well dressed in terms of the patterns on your outfits. Some children, if they, it is too symmetrical, they kind of get so excited or so involved in figuring out the patterns on your dress or in the patterns on your outfit rather than listening to you because it is so distracting or extra, extra interesting for them to focus on. So it's important to evaluate that as well. So when presenting the materials to the children, as, as mentioned before, it was so important for me to learn because as, as a speech therapist, I'm so uh, involved in talking and making sure the child uh, understands something and then to deliver it again and again and again. And sometimes this uh, teaching children chess uh, actually helped me to figure out that I had to be clear and concise and pause. And by pausing, you could, could see that the child is taking it in and needed that time to process because this was new to them. I had to speak in short sentences to, in, to make sure that the, the children do understand what I'm saying. Um, I had to uh, also make sure that I test and retest their understanding of a concept. As mentioned before, uh, uh, spatial orientation is a really hard thing to understand. So it's important to actually um, present it on different platforms so that a child can understand it. Um, yeah, so like demonstrations, role play, social stories on the demo board, on the floor board, and also to reinforce that concept with worksheets. It's also important to revise that concept in the next lesson, because sometimes you find that you maybe uh, did a lesson and you were gonna go on to a new topic and maybe we had a break. So it's important to actually revise that, that lesson just to keep the, the flow and to make sure that in your mind, you know that the child really does understand what we were talking about. The other thing I had to learn uh, was to go slow. There is no, nothing that says that it will take me only two lessons to teach a child the concept of uh, orientation to the, to the chessboard. You have to work at the child's learning pace. So sometimes it might take me five lessons or, so, or 10 lessons to actually get them com comfortable with certain concepts in chess. I also must make, uh, must just remind everyone that Actually, chess is a language on its own, and we are presenting uh, concepts that are quite ambiguous. So if you had to say the word knight, knight, you can see, is the person that's in an army, so a fighter. Knight could be the opposite of day, and that's what they might uh, a child with autism might think when you said knight. Then you're presenting them with a 3D photo of knight, and then a line drawing representation, which is seen as the most complex level of representation. So it's important to actually uh, make sure that your child knows exactly what you're talking about. And the same applies to a queen or a king. And castle is about more difficult because if you looked and you know, parents do try and Google chess, especially when they don't know. And then sometimes the rook is referred to as a castle as well. And then you've got castling as a chess move. So it's important that what, when you say a word or when you are introducing a, a concept to actually evaluate the child's understanding of it. And even uh, when, when we talk about the board games, sometimes to play multiple meanings as a board game is also good to encourage this type of thinking. Um, as mentioned before, we used social stories and posters uh, in our room so um, that the children could get familiar with, uh, with chess and exactly how it looks like. So photos were a very good uh, a platform to use um, and a resource to use for them to understand the concepts a bit more easily. Uh, here, I am pointing to uh, the corner squares just, just to show you the levels and the different platforms that we used 
when we're teaching our concepts. So here uh, I'm pointing to the corner squares on the chest spot. And as I mentioned before, special concepts is, is particularly difficult. Um, then you'll find that the child is given an opportunity to show the targeted square on a demo board. And it also creates a, a lovely opportunity for turn taking. So if he made a mistake here, sometimes you get a peer that will come and correct him or he would figure it out himself because I might re-give the definition or I might orientate him to the board um, saying exactly where we are looking at. Uh, so making sure that he is successful. Uh, also what I found is that they are highly competitive. So the one that knows the answer would want to run to the board first, but there'll be always the one that will be very quiet in the corner trying not to participate. So it's very important to include everyone when you are delivering your lesson. Uh, depending on the level of literacy, we can also uh, increase the level of difficulty of uh, an activity. So here a child was given a target uh, square word like a center or a corner or um, uh, edge piece, and uh, they had to find it on the floorboard. Here we just said find the corner pieces and we gave, we told four children to go and find it. And this was the end where they worked together and they tried to figure out where the corner pieces were and they, they stood there. Sometimes if a person stood in the, if a child stood in the wrong square, then you'd always get a leader telling them exactly where it is. And you'd find that it does encourage a bit of problem solving skills because maybe one found a corner piece and then a corner square and then the other, other child decided, ah, so that's what a corner square is and then went to his corner. Uh, so it did encourage a lot of problem solving, uh, working together uh, and uh, working as a group. And it also meant that each child has to talk to each other to figure it out. Um, here they are finding ranks and files on their own uh, boards. And then they will be doing it as a class group in their workbooks. And as was mentioned before, they also given the homework as well for the parents to revise the concepts. Here we are trying to find uh, the matching for 3D to 2D. So each one is given different cards and then they've given their uh, package of chess pieces and they're trying to find it. And here, this is Richard uh, in the first picture. He's showing off his uh, sticker for getting uh, his board ready for a mini game. And I find that that was actually the, uh, the currency that the kids loved are uh, stickers. Stickers, high five, and some affect where you say, you know, well done or, or excellent job. Uh, they, they, I love that, that type of reinforcement. I also thought, felt that my speech therapy aims were also uh, being, being helped here by the fact that I would call out uh, you know, find your bishops or find the, the king and they all try and find it. And it meant that it is encouraging listening skills and following directions. Here, the kids are getting ready to play a pawn parade. And uh, you can see that they just beginning to start playing together, which I must say they were really appreciating. And as mentioned before, kids can be highly competitive. So you are just observing one group of children and already the others are putting their hands up to say, I've won or, or something like that. And you realize that you really have to work fast and, and go between the kids quite quickly because of their competitive streak. I notice it more with the older groups than the younger group. Just some anecdotal evidence that I want to share. So this is Kazi in the Autistic Five unit. He's uh, 10 years, three months old. He's unable to write and can read a few simple words. He has minimal speech. And when I say he's unable to write, uh, I'm trying to say that he's not able to write his name. So if you had to say, Kazi, write your name, he'd only write N and K. And minimal speech, as in he would put two words together just to try and uh, communicate his thoughts and needs. And after attending uh, chess lessons for just a term, 
he appeared more aware and definitely knew when it was his chest day. Now, the speech he inside me kind of had their ego killed because I felt he identified me more as a chess teacher than a speech therapist because I do take the class for speech therapy and never did he ever figure out that it's a speech therapy day, but he did for chess. Um, and as soon as he entered the schoolyard, he would say, today's chess, today's chess. It did drive his teacher crazy up till today. Uh, the next is the Pasishle. So she is one that gets into a lot of trouble with her teacher because she tries her best to avoid most written, written tasks at school. Um, but she surprised us all by her drawings and her expressions of her feelings. So she's, as well, she uses minimal, minimal speech to communicate. And the fact that she could express it in this written form just made uh, the teacher so happy and also provided us with such good evidence that, you know, we, as, as with uh, Kali's uh, story, that if you had the right uh, avenue or the right modem, you would find that children do are able, or are able to express themselves. Also, we, we came up with some motivational awards so that the, the parent also knows who is actually, um, I mean, we, what we are doing in chess. And uh, you find that parents would give feedback that, yes, I also find that uh, they are doing this at home, or can you explain to me what you mean by uh, uh, certain concepts? So we find that the, the, the certificates and the awards actually got us closer to parents and child, and also they it encouraged family uh, activities at home as well. So basically, my observation so far is that the kids were the children were very motivated to come to the lessons. They needed demonstrations and a lot of repetitions. That is the most important thing that you have to make sure that it is at a level that the child can understand, and to constantly repeat your concept or repeat. Uh, and demonstrate what you are teaching them in order for them to feel comfortable to actually show you what they understand. Um, a, big, a big thing is that uh, the week's events did in influence their participation. Like if a teacher was absent or maybe they had a computer lesson that was canceled for that week and that affected a particular child. And so when he came into the chess lesson, he was highly stressed and as we say, dysregulated. So it's important that we actually have that dialogue with them to try and figure out what it could be that uh, was stressing them or triggering this uh, particular behavior. Because it doesn't mean maybe that it was the chess lesson or the chess room that actually uh, triggered this behavior. It could be the fact that something happened in the week or the or even the lesson before, or even sometimes in the lineup just before they could come into the chess room. I also found that the words that I choose when I explain things from group to group had to be very specific to the child's understanding. And sometimes children were able to, to express uh, their thinking to me uh, as to how they understand a the concept. So if you had to say horizontal, some, in some groups, they preferred the term side to side, whereas the other group preferred the term left to right when you're explaining the word horizontal. I found that the more competent children were slightly less motivated and wanted the lessons to move at a faster pace because you are explaining to one, one set of group um, because they needed that repetition, whereas the more competent ones just wanted you to move along. Uh, the room definitely had to be structured, well organized and less distracting at all times. Children, as I mentioned before, were always motivated by rewards, stickers, um, and they were quite competitive. Uh, sorry, that seems to be right. Uh, each child had a specific way of comprehending the information as well. And it was interesting to note that when you had to introduce the pawn, um, because the child had to figure out from the opponent's side how their pawn would move and how have your pawn would move. Uh, even though I would say it would move forward two, two squares or one square forward, this particular child told me, you mean higher and lower. So 
his pawn would move higher and the opponent's pawn would move lower. So it gave me a kind of an idea that the type of words I use and, and how they understand, I must be accepting of it and also reinforce it with the child to say that, yes, your understanding is absolutely correct. Um, we always te uh, test and teach as a revision of, co of concepts. It's vital to the game. I, as I mentioned before, uh, we use different mediums. As I, as I also mentioned, uh, the role play is quite a difficult thing to choose, but with support, you find that they are more accepting. Um, we adapted uh, social games. Uh, we do watch videos. We use puzzles and word games to encourage better comprehension and interaction. Uh, and we have to always be aware of the child's environment. You know, as I said before, the teacher being absent, uh, lessons being canceled, does influence their emotional state. At the moment so far, my comments from the teachers, uh, they felt that they noticed that the, uh, that the learners showed a keen interest in the chess lessons. The chess sessions were used as a reward to encourage good behavior in the classroom. I don't know if that's a good thing, where they'd say, do this maths, and then you can have your chess lesson. The learners showed greater interest in mathematical concepts, especially with spatial relations. Uh, they appeared more interactive in other social uh, situations, and they were able to relate these uh, experiences regarding the chess uh, lessons to their teacher spontaneously. So as soon as they went back to uh, the teacher, they would say something that they learned about chess, which I thought was very encouraging. Uh, as I said before, there are definitely some limitations. Uh, 30 minutes is sometimes too short to complete a concept. Sometimes you feel like you just had their attention and then the bell goes. Um, we also have quite a bit of time constraints because it's part of a school and uh, each lesson you are busy. So it's difficult sometimes to have uh, time to prepare and to follow up. Um, this year was quite a stressful year for South Africa as we had floods and uh, uh, we had, uh, so there was quite a bit of school that we missed. Uh, also holidays and school events, you know, you have to get lesson, lessons canceled. So your follow up uh, is quite difficult and, and to maintain that continuity from one lesson to the other. Sometimes you can't access your videos because of load shedding and, so, and our resources are still quite limited. Um, in conclusion, I'd, I'd like to say lots of thank yous. Firstly, thank you so much to this infinite uh, project and to uh, Nadia and the team for their support and guidance. I think we wouldn't be so confident in tackling this without the support and, and the beautiful resources that you have given us. Um, to our coach, Eric Tekawara, for his ongoing uh, support and training, and definitely to our school principal who we have like an open door policy. We can just ask her for anything and she, she kind of supports this project so beautifully. So definitely heartfelt thanks to our principal and to our children and parents who participated in this project and uh, who always provided us with valuable information and that guided our intervention uh, programs. I also want to say that I definitely grew more as a therapist because of chess, uh, of this pep of this platform, you know, of, of teaching chess. So thank you so much.